Hello, welcome uh, to Festival Literatura. Uh, I am uh, Jose Fernandez Alberto. I am a political scientist uh, normally at the National Research Center in Madrid. Uh, I, uh, but now since January, I actually work as an advisor for the Ministry of Social Security, Inclusion and Migration in the Spanish government. So I have uh, I am, uh, so this thing of interviewing people that I admire is something very new to me, uh, but it's uh, someone, I am someone who has been uh, a user of the work uh, that um, the people that we are interviewing today uh, have been producing in the last uh, years, both as, a, as a, an academic and now as a policy practitioner in a way. So I have both sides on that on that front. So today we have with us uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. Uh, it is uh, uh, it would be very boring to go through all their achievements, uh, both academic and uh, in the real life uh, world. They are the 2019 Nobel Prize winners for the work on um, uh, how experimental economics can achieve uh, can alleviate help alleviating poverty. They are both professor of economics at MIT. Uh, uh, and I think uh, probably their biggest achievement is to come up with this huge agenda for using experimental tools uh, to help in our fight, in, to improve living conditions more generally across the globe. And I think the most evident uh, consequence of that is the, the Poverty Action Lab that they run at the MIT, in which they are compiling, conducting, analyzing huge amounts of data uh, in this uh, important search for against, um, uh, against poverty. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, they pub almost 10 years ago, roughly, they published uh, Poor Economics, which is uh, a book in which they compiled many of their achievements in this quest uh, for reducing poverty using experimental tools and seeing what works, what works and what doesn't, mostly in developing countries, but not only. Uh, and uh, a lot of things, and I think most of the material in that book is still very uh, alive and well. I still use it for my in my weekly uh, uh, life, many of the materials that are in that book and all the research around that book. But a lot of things have changed since they published uh, Poor Economics. And now they are here today because uh, last year they wrote Good Economics for Hard uh, Times, which is coming out uh, in Italian next September, as uh, this September, as Una Buona Economia per Tempi Difficile. Uh, in which uh, they, I guess, try to respond to some of the things that have happened in these 10 years. The change in the political landscape, uh, the change in the orientation of some of the policies that we've been exposed to. So I'm, I guess my first question after this introduction would be what is uh, what prompted you to write this book? What is new in this book compared to the, your previous work in which you just were trying to let the world know what you were learning in those experiments that you were running in different parts of the world? Well, this is a book that's more prompted by the circumstances. In some ways, that was, as you say, that was more a reaction to our own research. This is more a reaction to the world. This is a, we felt, uh, I think, perhaps self-servingly that the world is a little bit in need of sense that you know there was there was just so many conversations where you might think economics would have a role to play but in fact the economics that was often being offered was either uh, you know just politically slanted or wrong or both often both and 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 so we felt that there was a need for a book that would kind of address the big issues of of the time, not necessarily issues we have done research on, which was much more the spirit of the previous book, but it's issues on which the 
there is research and sometimes that research tells us stuff that you know isn't in the public conversation and so we thought it would be useful to bring that research back into the public conversation what is it that uh, in this uh, in this line of thought what is it that so if you one if one reads poor economics or your uh, most of your uh, research on how to alleviate small problems uh, how research can help us understand to solve small problems but that have huge consequences rather than let me put it very characteristically rather than have very big questions with very little consequences which is some of part of the research that you were reacting to so how is it the political environment in which we operate or in which we live today um, is it willing to accept some of the lessons that you give to politicians what one, one question coming from a field of, of as a political scientist and coming from a field of political economy, one question that I've always asked is what kind of political environment you see as more um, uh, friendly to listening to your proposals, to accepting the way of working, of, of your, your, your open uh, approach to policy, uh, your experimental way of doing things. Uh, how is it that you see the political environment affecting the way in which your uh, findings uh, are translated into policies? So I think it depends a bit uh, what you define about the political, how you define the political environment, because uh, um, the political environment is defined both by the, let's say, the more blustering, uh, the more visible people, uh, the presidents, the politicians who actually play electoral politics and and, and uh, write on Twitter and speak at conventions and so on and so forth. But it's also the, the politics as in the day-to-day -day administration of our lives is also made by um, many other people. And so if you take the US, for example, today, it might seem to be like the, the worst possible kind of environment. Uh, to be interested in, in, in this way of thinking at the world, which is more pragmatic and, you know, evidence-based and fact-based, um, if you listen to our president, for example. But even in this environment, there are states and there are cities and there are administrations and they, they all uh, uh, somehow need to model to and conduct their work. And at some level, in the absence of any uh, reasonable guidance from the top, uh, there, there is even more mm -hmm. of a desire to get, uh, uh, to, at least in some corners, in a very decentralized way, uh, to get advice and recommendations. And also there are many countries in the world, so at the same time as um, some countries become easier to work with, some countries become more difficult to, to work with. But there is always this difference between the politics with a big P, if you want, mm -hmm. and the day-to-day -day politics with a small P, which is always more responsive and, in a sense, more in need of what we have to say, which is which has more to do with implementation and, and choices between particular policy tools than between big principles. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in particularly in, uh, on this point, so when you look at... Um, because one of the big... I'm not, not. I'm not going to make a lot of spoilers of this of this of this book because I mean it would be impossible in these 45 minutes. But one of the nicest one. I mean one of the nicest things that you have, uh, one of the nicest arguments that you have in the book is this idea that this focus on big aggregates like uh, the growth rate, for instance, sometimes make politicians or policymakers or administrations to look at the wrong places and rather than to look at the right tools that they can use to improve people's life. And again, thinking from a political science perspective, uh, something that we know is that politicians are super, super sensitive to these big aggregates because they are, they know that their re-election chances depend upon them. Uh, whereas it is much more difficult to make them see how these uh, small but crucial policies that they can uh, invest on matters for their future prospects. 
So that is why I guess my question comes comes from this this uh, recognition that on the one hand they are very well aware that the important policies that they can engage in require this careful analysis that you propose. But on the other hand, for them, it's very difficult to see how that translates into, I don't know, an increased chance of being re-elected or a better, uh, uh, an easier way of finding coalition partners in the future. Uh, and I, my sense is that in some, in our polar, very polarized um, context, uh, politicians are much even more uh, it is more difficult for them to listen to your advice sometimes and to pay attention to some things that maybe are not that important in changing people's lives but they are say they perceive to be much more crucial for their politician uh, for their political uh, prospects so do you see something in our political systems changing that may it's are making their politi our politicians much more uh I don't know, closed or or less sensitive to the kind of lessons that you can give them, or more, or under what what kind of do you see lights of hope in certain uh, areas more than others? What kind of thing as citizens we can do to make our 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 politicians more likely to be sensitive to the kind of lessons that you give them, that to the kind of message that this very simplistic and probably wrong way of thinking about the world uh, do they have? Uh. I guess I don't. Uh, I think you you are right in highlighting the fact that when we look at the headlines, it seems the world is uh, kind of gone going to hell in a handbasket. There's just too many loud mouths with very little uh, understanding or even care about um, any nuances of policy who are running the world. But I'm not sure that I see that. I see very much of a reflection of that when it comes down to, you know, how you how you actually deal with the problem. Even even Mr. Trump sort of, I think his problem is not that he wouldn't want a, sol a solution. He just doesn't have the patience in, in himself to listen to follow a solution through for more than three days because it's not a headline. And in some sense, I feel that. Around him, there are people who are constantly struggling, even with, with their political views and with his toxic version of politics, uh, to kind of manage uh, to bring some, save some lives. Because it is I, one place maybe I disagree with you is that I think he does care a lot about uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, he keeps claiming the U.S. has done incredibly well in dealing with COVID, but he's, it's a, it's one that thing he keeps saying it partly because I think he feels that it's not true. It's every headline around him screams that the U.S. has the had the highest number of cases or whatever, and he he wants he, the reason why he wants to change the measurement or the testing is partly to fix those statistics. So he he thinks that that's an important statistic. So there is always a space even with these awful politicians and he's as awful as any um to to intervene i, I think that the problem is to me is more that uh, in this particular instance we really don't have a lot of very uh, you know beyond the obvious which is that you know if you if you shut down more you get more you more you get slow down the flow of the disease but then you pay for it I don't think we have something very useful to say. That's sort of where I think in the, in the nub has been that the, the mostly beyond the original insights about, you know, you, you better wear a mask and, you know, stay away from people. We haven't really made much progress in, in you know, pinning down exactly what, what would work and the trade-offs still look pretty dire. So I, I feel that if there was, if we actually had something very, concrete and useful to offer which would provide a, you know kind of reduce the the sharpness of the trade-off between economic shutdown and uh, safety i think people even he would listen I, I don't think i think he's also grasping for straws he's looking for whatever these fake medicines which which he wants to uh, push partly because they offer some trade-off so i i think there is there is receptiveness even at that level. Mm -hmm. 
So let me let me as I was let me move a little bit about uh, the general themes that you touch upon in the book, because it's a very um, ambitious and overarching in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of lessons that you want people to take from what economics have been doing and what your approach has to tell not only political policymakers but also citizens and, and interested people more, more generally about what. Uh, and this is a reaction that I don't know if you share with me. So if I would read a similar book 20 years ago about what good research in economics tells us about how we should move, in what direction we should move policy in different fronts, in trade, in migration, in regulation of labor market, social policy, what have you. My, I mean, this is very, again, very characteristic probably, but my sense is that 20, 30 years ago, you would have probably uh, observed a lot of proposals for reform that would look from a political point of view, uh, either liberal in the European sense, that uh, markets should be made more flexible, that there are a lot of regulations, that there are forces that should be unleashed, and that the political process by giving way to people that would suffer in that process is preventing these good things from happening. I mean, this is again, very characteristic. Now, in, particularly in your book, but I think your book uh, is part of a general sense of how the economics profession is moving, either you look at climate change, migration, the kinds of things you propose on social policies, taxes, etc., it looks like way to the left of what the median voter of our systems are willing to accept, which is kind of the opposite. It's not that the people uh, is not willing to accept reforms that they don't like because of the distributive concept, or maybe they do, but so what is, 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 is it this description accurate according to you? And, and, and if it's so, what is what has changed? The kind of economics uh, lessons that are being given or the kind of the median voter, to put it in that term, has moved to the right in these 20 years and why so? Uh, that's a great, that's a great point. I, it, it's maybe one exception to the left-right uh, divide between economists and the public is on trade, where I think if you ask most economists are very much uh, remain in favor of international trade, whereas there is a good uh, one third at least of the people who are very much in favor of, of restrict international trade. Um, in general, uh, one thing that we note in the book is that uh, uh, people tend to disagree with economists on most things, uh, either from the left or from the right. Or, uh, um, and, but I think you're absolutely right about uh, the, your sense that the profession has moved, uh, generally has moved left uh, uh, as in terms of the, the, not only the, the, maybe the political leaning of the people who participate, but uh, the papers that are being written. And I think it comes from maybe a number of <laughs> number of things, uh, but at least two things is on the theoretical side, increased sophistication, which in a sense, the the very, the basic answer that, oh, the markets are better for everything only hold under the, the, the most simplistic of assumptions. And it is possible that the people in Chicago who are pushing this most simplistic of assumptions happen to believe them ideologically, but it was also convenient for them to go with their ideology that they were easy to handle and therefore easy to teach and easy to uh, apply and therefore that the gender, the uh, magnificent, magnificent success uh, both uh, in the ide ideological sphere and in the academic sphere because it, it had the, the merit of, a, of an app apparent uh, ability to, to guide us in, in studying just about anything with the same, you know, ap apparent uh, uh, obvious <laughs> things that are obviously true. And I think we, as, as people became more sophisticated technically, they became able to handle exceptions or irregularity to these models and therefore to not be tied to the ideology of the people who, who initially made it so popular, like the Chicago School. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing that happened is, you know, what sometimes has been called the credibility revolution in, in empirical economics, which is the idea that uh, you have to be very serious in how you look at facts and I, how you interpret the evidence. And I think before, um, 
the credibility revolution, there was a little bit the idea that you have a model and you run some statistical analysis to support your model, but those statistical analysis in some sense are so weak that if they don't tell you what your model said, and you know, it's just as likely that your model, your analysis, empirical analysis is wrong and the model is, is, is correct. Uh, and you could flex things in so many different ways that you could always find proof for what you had to say. And what happened with the credibility revolution is some sense in which there are some things that you cannot just assert. <laughs> and in particular, a way of trying to be much more systematic in asserting what is causal and what is not. And can we say that a particular policy has called a particular effect? I'm not talking just about randomized control trial, I'm talking even about what came before, about how to analyze even the data from everyday life in a slightly more rigorous way. And once that happened, that also, you know, the, 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 the idea that everything goes as long as it proves my theory goes, goes by the window. At this point, uh, the facts become stronger. And we realized that some things that were held to be obviously true, for example, the idea that people would work uh, less if taxes were higher, happened not to be true in study after study after study. Or the fact that if there are more migrants in an economy, the low wage workers will uh, suffer happens not to be true in study after study after study. So, you know, eventually, and I don't think the people who worked in this agenda were particularly ideological one way or the other. Um, or if they were the ideological, they kind of tended to left it. We have friends who are working in this type of area who are coming from the right and other from the left, but they share this like devotion to 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 letting the, the facts speak. And that accumulated an agenda of evidence that just slowly, little by little, I think broke that fortress of the the, the simplistic models. And then therefore that gave a lot of food for thought for people who were willing to and reach the models, and then the model gave rise to different conclusions, and then um, the, the the field became much richer, much more contradictory with each with itself in, in in a way, depending on. But and, and I would summarize much more interesting as well, and uh, much more uh, left wing, <laughs> simply because the world has a has a knack for not wanting to conform to the most basic of our economic uh, wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. So, and so I, 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 this is very interesting. And I think there is, uh, I, I, and as you say, I was, it was probably unfair to call it like just left wing this move, but much, much more complex and much more probably the kind of lessons, but there is certainly a reaction to this very narrow minded view that probably neoliberalism has like 20 or 30 years ago domin was dominant in the in the academia but from the point of view of the public don't you observe um so one of the part of the explanation would be the field has moved to the left uh, quote unquote because of this comp learning to live with complexity the identification revolution etc but don't you observe a change in the mood of how the public react to some of the policies in terms of um so because this is something that particularly when anal analyzing the political feasibility of some of the reforms that you propose in the book, something that comes to, uh, like for instance, if you think about universal basic income uh, or a change in the way in which generally social policy are, are conducted in the forms of less conditionality, for instance, you make a big argument about why conditionality uh, to alleviate poverty, something makes uh, it uh, less, uh, it make, makes policies a much less effective way of reducing poverty, etc. cetera. Uh, and the reason one, I mean, looking from the policy making perspective, one of the reasons that you observe why conditionality is imposed is not because of the evidence tells you that it's important, but also because you have to gain the support of a lot of number of people that just likes conditionality to be imposed because that fits into their narrative. Or this lack of trust, for instance, in the ability of the state to transfer resources or changing the regulation to make it to make them work in the public good for instance i think there has been a change don't you see a change in that in that direction in the last 10 20 years uh, uh, in the sense of the public becoming a little bit 
more conservative or at least less friendly to state-based solutions to collective problems? So I think there are two separate pieces here, and it's important to kind of keep them separate. One is, I think, the question of, I think, faith in the state. And the other is the question of what the the diagnosis of what the problems are. And I think with the diagnosis, I don't believe the public has moved further to the right. On that, uh, I think the high point of right-wing thinking is the 1980s, the Reagan, Thatcher, you know, markets are everything, poor people are lazy. That particular uh, rather vicious culture of, uh, of, uh, of anti-poor, uh, kind of economic thinking. I, th I think that that's a, that's a period that I think, thankfully, is a bit behind us. I actually think that people, if you think, uh, look at people's views on, on you know, wealth taxes or things like that, I, I actually think that the reason why it's more back in the conversation is because people actually think it's, uh, it might be needed. I think people are reacting to the facts about inequality. So I don't, I don't think the, 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 where I think you're right is uh, people have maybe become even more frustrated with the ability of governments to make good changes. And I think that that, I feel, for example, in the United States, I feel that people, and I, I mean, I, this is a bit <coughs> something that I, I, I can't say I have any hard data to uh, to to demonstrate this, but I do feel that there was a there's a sense of betrayal, for example, that people felt with with the Obama government not bringing in more substantial social change. That the in the end the trends towards higher inequality and flat wages for the poor continued through those years, and I think those those kinds of things were. Uh, they, I think there was there was a failure of the the left, which made people think that governments are just always going to be uh, captured by the interests, uh, the, the, the powers that be. And in a sense, Trump came in with an agenda of arguing that he's going to be better defending the poor against the powers that be. That was very much his polit politics. He was, he was saying in the end, the Democrats are special interests. Uh, and mm -hmm. Polit politics too, and so there was no, uh, and I think that, and I think the sort of the, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that the government also did, I think, a less good job. I mean, I would say, in particular, uh, in the UK, um, I think, uh, I think the many very substantial achievements of the uh, the Tony Blair regime were forgotten by the in the end by the Iraq war and a bunch of other policy decisions that were uh, gratuitous in, in some ways. So I, I think that there was a sense in which the the failure of where the, gov the left-wing governments were effective, they didn't manage to be uh, particularly good at selling what they were doing. And I think that's partly because I feel that in a sense the uh, and maybe Esther disagrees on this. I don't think we've discussed this, but I, I feel that the, the policymakers, including the policymakers on the left, are too captive of the right-wing ideology that uh, we were describing before. That the economics of you know of free markets are ultimately what we need, and all of these other compromises are always costly. Whereas, in fact, there is very little. Uh, I mean, we may, may it may well be that if we actually raised the taxes a lot and and fought the high profit uh, making companies more, we would actually generate more efficiency because in fact the innovation rates are down probably because there is so much uh, so many monopolies and so I, I don't even, I'm not even mm -hmm. I don't even know that there is any evidence that there is a trade off between social policy and growth. I think this is this itself is somehow assumed by even by the left wing politicians. They seem to absor you know, embrace this. And I, I, I actually, as an economist, I don't think see any evidence that it's true. 
that there is a new trade-off. So I, I do feel that maybe part of the reason we have, we have sort of where we are is that the governments, both on the left and the right, have not actually been as aggressive in, you know, taking forward an agenda of actually helping the people who need help as they should have. And uh, maybe some government, I mean, I, I see a bit of that in France as well, you know, another centrist government that seems to be very scared of taking on a more left-wing agenda. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important, no, I, I, this is a very important, important point that actually permeates many of the lessons in the book, this, the centrality of trust in many of the policy reforms that you propose, for instance, and that, that, that is a thing, something that has been not given enough attention in many of the policy solutions of the past, for instance, the traditional compensation hypothesis to make people adjust to trade shocks or to uh, migration shocks and everything. I think there is there was something that was missing that I think permeates many of the of the lessons that you that you that, that one can extract from the book is this 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 problem of of trust into the mechanisms that make this compensation uh, uh, feasible. I want you to uh, uh, to ask you about in particularly these times about when I mean, you wrote this book before the pandemic. Um, uh, what kind of uh, lessons do you think, uh, I, I extracted some and I can bring them on, uh, some of the lessons that, that by reading your book one can uh, use to how to deal with the, with the pandemic. But if someone asks you about how uh, the existence of the, this big shock uh, that affects so many parts, I mean, so many dimensions of our social economic life is going to make our economies and our societies different. What kind of lessons you would ex if if uh, you would extract from the book in terms of dealing with this shock? In terms of, uh, I think one the way in which I was thinking about this is is this centrality of this term of stickiness that you have in the book about that people tend to be and social processes tend to be much more stickier that sometimes we tend to assume, and that it is difficult for people to change sectors to adjust to. Uh, and what implication does that have for COVID, for instance? Uh, is it that we should protect the jobs that are being uh, threatened right now as much as we can? Or is it that, on the contrary, that because a big transition is on our front, we should do a lot, of to, a lot to help people transform and to allocate resources in a more productive way the sooner as possible. I could, uh, I, I think they're both, uh, and uh, as a policy practitioner, I'm struggling with this question on, a, on my daily basis. So what is your view on this? So, so, it, so in general, we, we sort of uh, advocate in the book for, for a bit of both, which is that uh, you, on the one hand, when since the economic keep hitting shocks, technology, trade, etc., keep hitting uh, economies with shocks. We need to both uh, devote a lot of resources to help people uh, adapt to these shocks. So we talk, for example, about uh, retraining uh, that has shown to be effective for people who are displaced by trade, but have been has been terribly underused. We talk about childcare that helps people um, move uh, and also is provides jobs, actually, uh, that they could take in other sectors than the ones they are now. We talk about housing policy, uh, unemployment insurance, and the like. And then at the same time, and I think that part of it would be is very uncontroversial with our uh, colleagues, in the sense that everybody thinks that more fluidity is, is better than less fluidity, and therefore all of this is nice. Uh, and but then on the other hand, we also take what is, is a somewhat more controversial position that some people just will not move or will only move at such considerable considerable uh, cost that we just need to admit that they are not going to move and maybe um, um, allow them to stay in place and pay them to stay in place. And uh, in some sense, we advocate a policy. Uh, for trade, that's some 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 version of what's been done from COVID for COVID, which is asking the firm not to fire people and sustain their employment. Now it's very different for trade because it's not like a few months like what was believed for COVID. But the decision that was made in Europe 
on COVID was very different than the one that was made in the US and in my opinion, much, much better, which is to not ask people to go become unemployed, deal with the unemployment benefits, et cetera, et cetera, and then maybe refine their jobs or another job, but ask the firm to keep people on the payroll and then support the payroll directly, which was very much an idea that why make people go to this transition that are going to be extraordinarily costly with the hope in the case of COVID that these jobs would come back eventually. In the case of trade shocks or technological transformation, of course, that's not necessarily the case. The job or those jobs might not come back. But the idea that transitions are costly is something that was recognized in the time of COVID and maybe we can take that concept and apply it more, more generally. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that I would not have thought that uh, this is the, uh, the pandemic seems like such a management challenge that to innovate in this time, it doesn't seem obvious to me. I would say that there, there are good reasons, as you say, to think about transitions, but in the middle of this shock, uh, I think the just the capacity of governments is extremely stretched. They are mostly, even even like you know if you look at countries like france the it's just uh, you know first order it's it's and this france is a country with immense uh, bureaucratic cap capability but they're stretched to the limit thinking about covid that's that's first second and third issue it just doesn't seem to me a time when the government is going to be very effective in facilitating transitions and and change it just doesn't this this it seems bureaucratically unlikely mm -hmm. that's and do you think in this uh permanent debate about how life after COVID would change do you see um and there i mean thinking in just one dimension that that you brought uh, up in the book which is this um tendency of modern uh, economies and modern societies to cluster into hubs because those are where the opportunities are. Uh, there's this debate about whether they're teleworking, the persistence of teleworking might prevent this thing from happening or slow down that process at least. Uh, do you see that occurring? Do you see, uh, I mean, is, is this a critical juncture or is, or is it rather an event that when 10 years from now we would look just as something, as a bump that we had to go through but that we recovered following the same processes that were running before. Sorry I, for making this up. <laughs> and the my crystal ball is broken. It remains to be seen. And one of the things that we are saying in the book is economists are terrible at making predictions, but they, can, <laughs> they cannot resist. <laughs> but I think we are also not perfect at avoiding predictions. <laughs> We are better than most people because we are made a, a career trying to not to. It. So I think we, it's, it's, we should not risk it. Um, there is so I think it's going to depend on so many factors that is like really hard to say. In particular, it's going to depend on both uh, how the epidemic is is controlled. Uh, is it through a vaccine that's extremely effective and taken by everyone, which is the optimistic scenario, but seems maybe overly optimistic? Or is it through a vaccine that's semi-effective and that not everybody takes and then better treatment? And then uh, so it becomes something that is with us in the sense that uh, if that stays with us in a sort of permanent way, then many things about the way that farm produce and people consume and people interact with each other will have to, to probably will adapt in a, in, in a more fundamental way. And mm -hmm. if we have no idea on that. It's very hard to tell you what's going to happen. It, like, I, how, would I, how would I know what's going to happen once we go back to normal, since I have not an idea of what normal would look like? I mean, I think that you're right in probably thinking that some models new models will be experimented with. I think that's, that's, that is very clear that there will be, you know, this whole thing of everybody trying to, in the New York uh, today, 
yesterday's New York Times had everybody's trying to move to suburbia. And I think those kinds of things, uh, you know, the structure of living will change. And when it's a little bit, and maybe people have, will have experiments with, you know, can we have distributed living and, you know, more decentralized work? I, I think there will be important experiments. Some com companies will try it, will in the process learn what the costs are. We haven't quite encountered the costs yet. We'll learn the cost what the costs are. I, I'm if I had to say, predict one thing, and you know, I'm not exactly going on a, on a big limb here, I would say there'll be lots of experiments with teaching, with with working together, with the distributed, and I'm I feel that some of that will actually be maybe even be good. I think the outcomes might be. I, I think there is uh, clearly the if production gets a bit more decentralized, that'll be a good thing. There's too much real estate in the US, in in most of Western Europe, which is underused and uh, because it's in places that are no longer lived in. And I think that there are, that there's benefits and likewise for teaching. I think there is benefits of, of um, teaching classes for 10,000 people, including some in in the Democratic Republic of Congo, rather than for, you know, 40 people just at MIT. No, no. Totally. So let me, uh, uh, we have only a few minutes left. Uh, there's some topic that, uh, one of the chapters that I enjoyed reading most of the book is uh, maybe because of my own bias, was this chapter on on uh, social policies and and and, and, and the debates about universal basic income, uh, job guarantee, uh, the differences between poor countries and rich countries and uh, the effects that... Uh, and I, uh, something that I liked that I found very original was this perspective of putting the recipient of all these policies in the center of the analysis and how does the recipient perceive them, this sense of dignity, the sense of how does he process all these policies that are affecting uh, them. Um, so we in Spain, for instance, implemented are now in the in the in the course of implement deploying a new minimum guaranteed uh, income. Uh, Italy passed; they had a new in guaranteed income uh, a few years ago. There is this permanent debate, this new bunch of new round of experiments with universal basic income. And I'm not going to make it spoiler about what your views are about uh, on these things, which is very nuanced and and but at the same time very. Uh, uh, original in many ways, uh, but what do you? What, how do you see our our policies moving in the developing in the developed world in these fronts? Uh, do you see the main obstacle being the middle classes not willing to pay the price of these new ambitious policies that require a lot of resources? Do you see greater demand, even as a result of COVID, of there, there's going to be shocks that transform our economy and we want to have policies already in place that protect us from shocks that we cannot protect uh, ex ante. Um, uh, this, and, and, and I guess this big debate between how important is protecting jobs or the, uh, or the ability of people having uh, 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 a job uh, in protecting their well-being. Is it possible to give a sense of well-being to people without uh, offering them a job in the sense of making them meaningful uh, meaningful existence in their social uh, atmosphere or is it not and 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 what your views are and you are the UBI. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you start. Yeah, resident uh, UBI expert. Go ahead. I mean, sure. I, I, I guess uh, you asked many questions and I. <laughs> I think we're not going to get to the end of that conversation. That's a long conversation. I think that one thing that um, we we know reasonably uh, well is that uh, we, in terms of the difference between one point we make in this book is that there's, there's a big difference between countries like Spain and countries like whatever Kenya. And one of that is that you know the amount of information we have about who is actually suffering is actually enormously greater. And, and one of the failures we've had throughout is we have made predictable errors. We knew these people are going to get screwed and we didn't help them. So I think part of the 
part of the uh, challenge is going to be, of course, resources. So even if resources are limited, I feel that there is a case to be made for targeting people who are hurt. And sort of that's the sort of minimum income guarantee rather than a, a universal basic income that, you know, you, you and I think that that direction has some attractions especially if you're willing to create the infrastructure to have better information. Because I, I, I mean, one point we make in the book is that I think it's information that's the big constraint, not usually incentives. It's We just don't know who, who it is and we don't try to know. And I think if we did try to know, we could do better than we are doing. And that's that's maybe for a country like, let's say, Spain, to take a random example, given that you are asking this question, uh, I would say it's a, that's that's a trade-off, and I think using that information more effectively, given the budget constraints, might be uh, might be uh, a good policy. That's sort of the point we make in the book. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the other point that you you raised is the, the the point of dignity and what constitutes dignity. So, our, kind of one of the big arguments in this chapter is it's essential to put dignity back at the center of social protection system uh, because social protection systems both in rich and in poor countries have uh, are kind of still under the long shadow of victorian era sort of punishing systems where it is assumed that if you need help you must be either lazy or be protected from future laziness and therefore we need to make it as um, unpleasant as possible. And in, in the Victorian era, the system was designed on purpose to rob people of their dignity and of their freedom, actually, as, as they go, as they went along. And this is still with us, both in poor and in rich countries. And, and this is really what we need to get rid of because, first of all, it's, I think, extraordinarily costly on the people that we are uh, supposed to be helping, who often are you know, just to have been subject to a shock for no fault of their own on, on behalf of society in a way, or as, you know, innocent bystander of the changes, the societal changes. And second, it's uh, costly because it is part of the, I think, the conservatism that you were alluding before, people being extremely worried of changing anything just in case that hits them and their lifestyle. And therefore, that makes it difficult to adjust to uh, to, to changes that, that happen in the world, or to or to new to, to seize new opportunities, because nobody wants to move from where they are. You know, if you go back to the, the, the Trump slogan of "Make America Great Again," it was looking backwards, and it was it's not incidental. It's the idea of things were better before, and if we cannot go back to before, at least stay where we are now, where I have my job, etc. Because if I am to lose it, I'm going to lose not, on, not only my job, but the dignity with, that goes with it. And the, the problem of dignity has different implications in the poor, poorest country and in, um, in rich countries or even in middle income countries. Because in the poorest country, I think uh, it's a matter of survival. If you can put food on the table, that's not a given that you are able to put food on the table for your kids and your elders day after day after day. And if you cannot, that's horrible. This is something that makes people tremendously unhappy. There's a super strong correlation between people's self-reported happiness and whether or not they've they, they, they were someone has skipped meals in the previous mm -hmm. year. And therefore, uh, having, uh, if you combine that with the failure of information, etc., having a very simple system that's available to everyone, that everybody knows is in place, in case things really go badly, for a very little amount of money, will do a lot to protect dignity in case of shock and also to make sure, to ensure people in advance that they won't find themselves in this dignity robbing state. But if you go to rich countries, the, the problem of dignity is not linked to uh, um, uh, sheer economic survival. Uh, it is more than that. Uh, we need people want to be a part of or need to be a, a part of the productive society uh, to have a job or to have a role uh, in their network, in a network. And money is is always good to have, but it's not sufficient to make that happen. And therefore, if we put dignity at the center of the social policy system in the rich countries and we follow that thread, then we know it's not just money. 
it's money and your ability the the ability for people to get onto a project and i think that's the big mistake that the more libertarian defender of the ubi in silicon valley and others do they are thinking that ubi is a way of buying people's peace you know Robots are going to replace them, and but we can at least feed you and just leave us alone. I'm not saying it that way, but it's not very far from that. And that's just not going to work this way. I don't think anybody is going to want that uh, because that's not giving them, you know, the, the place that they that they ought to have. And therefore, it's better to you, you need to keep some money to first of all give enough money that is real livelihood that's at stake, which is expensive. And second of all, uh, have all of these comp complementary measures. So I would rather spend the same amount of money hiring people in jobs uh, uh, that are lo money losing, but good for society, like childcare, elderly care, or um, you know, now having lots and lots and lots of people monitoring mask use would be a good thing. Uh, that type of things, and um, uh, then then spending all the money in UBI. And I think that follows that, 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 that dignity logic. I, I really like it, my, this, this rich approach to these uh, complex questions. And, and I, I, as in all of your work, I really admire this way of uh, looking at all the social dimensions that are uh, surrounding these uh, problems and, and this very broad view of not only economic, but the social, psychological, uh, political implications of all uh, this. And I think that that makes your work very uh, original and different and innovative than than many uh, compared to many other things that that are out there. I think that I I I, I really like that and really like that that chapter. Uh, we have uh, run out of time. Uh, I just want to uh, recommend again. Uh, advise our, uh, our listeners in Italy to uh, buy this. Not only this book has brought about many other things that we have uh, talked about, many others in very rich uh, ways, but also it's very beautifully written. I'm sure the Italian editors have done also a very good job translating it. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to read. Uh, it has been an honor to for me to chat with you for 15 minutes. Uh, this is a joy, one of the joy of my profession that I didn't expect to. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know if something you. else. <laughs> uh, and uh, that uh, we should uh, think all because we are seven minutes late of what they are told. But uh, many thanks to the organizers. Uh, many thanks obviously to you for uh, your availability and your thoughts and for your book and your work mostly. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank much. you. Thank you to the organizers as well for having us. Take care. Bye.